This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I've been asked to introduce Peter Van Alphen. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody here know, know Peter. Um, so the topic today is um, Peter is trying to prove that being an archaeologist can be a dangerous profession. Uh, so maybe Dr. Jones uh, and Harrison Ford are not completely wrong about what that uh, activity means. So in the midst of the Second World War, the NS received uh, two substantial donations associated with Richard Norton, an American scholar who led a short-lived archaeological expedition in 1910 and 11 in Cyrene in what used to be um, Italian Tripolitana and now uh, Libya. So it's an ill-fated expedition, I understand, where some people lost their lives. Uh, but Peter is going to tell, to tell us more about it. So without further ado, Peter. Thank you, Gilles. Thank you. Um, so this, this is a project which I began a little bit, uh, or, or a while ago. This is um, an ongoing project uh, that uh, developed out of my interest, uh, the coinage of Cyrene, and I've, I've published at least one, maybe two papers on archaic Cyrene, but as I began to look through the trays of the ANS's holdings of the coinage of Cyrene, I began to notice that we had an awful lot of coins associated with this fellow Richard Norton. And as I began to look more into this, I began to discover a rather interesting story associated with the excavation that Richard Norton led uh, in 1910, 1911, but also just some rather inexplicable problems with the coins held at the ANS and um, with their donation, which I will um, try to present and resolve uh, today. So, um, as Gilles uh, noted, uh, in the midst of the Second World War, the American Numismatic Society received donations that together totaled over 600 coins, and all of these coins were associated with Richard Norton, who was born in 1872 and who died in 1918. Uh, Norton led uh, what turned out to be a rather ill-fated and short-lived expedition in 1910-1911 to Cyrene, which had been uh, in the archaic or the classical and archaic period a rather important city uh, in North Africa, in today's Libya, um, initially settled by Greek colonists uh, sometime in the 8th or 7th century BC. Now, Cyrene, uh, over time, um, rose to great wealth and prominent, prominence, uh, primarily through the export of silphium, uh, a plant that was used to make a hugely popular relish, I mean, something like uh, pickle relish or something that um, uh, the peoples throughout the Mediterranean area just could not get enough of. And Cyrene, at least for a while, um, essentially had a monopoly on this uh, export. Um, to this day, um, scientists and others, botanists, are still not entirely sure what silphium might have been. It seems to be uh, uh, part of the Asaphoetida family. Um, and more recently, there's been an article in National Geographic in which um, scholars there tried to argue that this was actually Ferula Judiana. Um, in fact, uh, we had a photographer here from uh, National Geographic last year who was shooting some of our coins for that article, so please do check it out. So um, the first of the two donations of Newton Norton's coins came by way of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in 1941, and I'll get more into that in a bit. And the second came from Norton's family in 1944. And some years before that, um, certainly before 1927, the society's then president, the famed numismatist Edward T. Newell, who is right now looking over my shoulder, that painting, um, had also acquired over a dozen and a half coins from Norton's family as well, which eventually came into the society's collection as part of Newell's 1944 bequest. And in the, night, in the middle of the 1970s, Theodore Buttrey, who served as the numismatist for the more recent American excavations in Cyrenaica, which were led by the University of Michigan, he published a brief overview and a skeletal catalog of the Norton coins um, held at the society as an appendix 
to one of his publications on the excavation coins. And Buttrey, in this publication, assumed that some of the coins of the 1941 MFA donation were, in fact, dug up as part of Norton's 1910-11 excavations, while also noting that many had probably been purchased from locals. Now, despite Buttrey's publication, there are, in fact, a number of reasons for revisiting these coins associated with Norton. More recent archival research on Norton's time in Cyrenaica has shed some additional light on the provenance of the coins. And in addition, Buttrey, in fact, did not locate all of the ANS coins in the ANS, in, in the ANS collection. And I've been able to uh, locate dozens more, including uh, you know, many coins that were produced outside of Cy Cyrenaica. And finally, um, with the recent publication of Michele Assolati's um, recent study of the bronze coinage of Cyrenaica, Buttrey's attributions and dating of the material, in fact, does need some updating. So what I would like to do this afternoon is first discuss Norton's time in Cyrenaica and the provenance of the coins before providing a brief updated overview of the coins. And for those of you who might be interested in a more detailed look at this material, in fact, I'm just days away right now from submitting to Michele Assolate a version of this for publication in a volume that he is editing on coinage of Cyrenaica, which hopefully will be published later this year in 2023. So, um, as detailed by Jamie Ullenbrook in a series of three reports published in the journal Libyan Studies, in which he presents newly discovered archival material, American interest in pursuing an excavation project in Cyrenaica began already in the 1880s and continued in fits and starts until a group of Americans, led by Richard Norton, obtained a firmam, a, a permit, from the Turkish officials in Istanbul in the spring of 1910 to excavate at Cyrene. And by the autumn of that year, in October, Norton's excavations were underway, sponsored jointly by the American Institute of Archaeology and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And each of the two sponsors, as noted by Arthur Fairbanks, then director of the MFA, had different interests in the project. The Institute st sought glory, it was newly formed at that time, while the museum sought artifacts to fill its galleries. And in addition, a handful of wealthy men, notice, notably Allison Amor and James Loeb Jr., provided both financial and material support for the project. Amor was a particular help offering the use of his yacht, Utawana, to, to transport supplies and personnel um, between England, Malta, and North Africa. You want your presentation on the screen? No, thanks. Um, Norton at the time was in his late 30s and was employed um, as a curator by the MFA, a position he had held from 1907 until his death 11 years later. The youngest child of Charles Eliot Norton, the famed Harvard professor of the classics and the founder of the AIA, Richard followed in his father's footsteps, obtaining his A.B. at Harvard in 1892, then spending time abroad in both Greece and Italy as a student and holding professional appointments, including as director of the American School of Classical Studies at Rome, which merged with the American Academy at Rome in 1912. This, in fact, was not Norton's first time in Cyrenaica. In 1904, he had paid a quick and unofficial visit along with Alison Amore and David Hogarth of Oxford while they were sailing along the North African coast in Utawana en route to Greece. Five years later, in 1909, Norton helped lead an, an, an official expedition to Cyrenaica to survey and map potential sites for excavations. Sponsored by the MFA and the AIA, this survey expedition was the brainchild of Oric Bates, a fellow who was 10 years Norton's junior and who was also a curator at the MFA. Bates was nominally in charge of the survey, but Norton had been given oversight in a really rather complicated arrangement, which Ullenbrock has brought to light. 
Um, and after um, Bates' return to the states in June 1909, and after submitting his report on the survey, he was rather um, unfortunately dismissed, and Norton put firmly in charge of future AIA uh, MFA activity in Cyrenaica, uh, much to Bates's extreme disappointment. Norton's excavations at Cyrene continued for six months, from October 1910 to May 1911, consisting of a small team of mostly American men who supervised a larger locally hired team of Arab workers. In the brief report on the first season of excavations, published in 1910 in the AIA's bulletin, Norton recounts many of the difficulties faced by the team, including, most shockingly, the murder of Herbert Fletcher Deku, a close friend of Norton's who had served as the team's epigraphist. Deku was shot and killed by a local assassin early on the morning of March 11, 1911, while leading a team of workers up to the excavation site. Now, despite this profound tragedy and the obvious danger it entailed, Norton elected to keep working until the end of the spring and planned to return again in October 1911 for a second season. The brevity of his initial report, published in the AIA's bulletin, he felt could be excused by the more voluminous reports to come, and these, of course, were never written since there was no second season. Norton was ultimately convinced that the Arab who shot the coup had been hired by certain Italians who, given Italy's colonial ambitions in North Africa, were less than pleased that the Americans had been given a firman to excavate one of the most important ancient sites in the region, something they felt should instead go to Italians, which of course it eventually did. Soon after the Turkish-Italian War began in September 1911, just months after the first excavation had ended, Norton published disparaging remarks about Italy and the Italian presence in North Africa in British newspapers, which, naturally, incensed Italian officials and public, and which all but assured that Norton would never return to Cyrene. And indeed, he never did. He spent a few years working on projects elsewhere in the Mediterranean until the start of the First World War, and during the war, he served in the American Volunteer Motor Ambulance Corps, which he had helped to establish, and he died in Paris of meningitis at the age of 46 in 1918, just weeks before the war ended. He left behind his wife Edith and a teenage daughter, Susan. 26 years later, in 1944, in the midst of yet another world war, Edith and Susan donated 450 bronze coins, plus a small number of artifacts, to the American Numismatic Society. In the Society's 1945 proceedings, it is noted that these coins had been, quote, brought back from Cyrene by the late Richard Norton, unquote. In the accession records, there is an additional note that the coins had been, quote, brought from Cyrene by J.F. Jones, unquote. And we'll return to Jones in a moment. Three years before Edith and Susan's donation in 1941, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts transferred an additional lot of, of 180 mostly bronze coins to the society that had also been brought back from Cyrene by Norton, but which included two small gold, gold coins and a number of silver coins. Now, correspondence between Edward Newell and the MFA suggests that the coins had been transferred to the ANS as early as 1935. The Society's curators at the time assumed that these coins were from Norton's excavations at Cyrene, and these have been cataloged as such, while those donated by his wife and daughter a few years later were noted as possibly coming from the excavations. So, all told, I've been able to locate in the Society's collections 174 out of the 180 of the 1941 MFA donation, which is 14 more coins than Butcher was able to locate, but only 279 of the 1944 donation of 450 coins, but still 58 more coins than Butchery was able to find. 
Unlike Buttery, I've had the added advantage of our digital catalog as a search aid, search aid sorry, which only started to come online after his 1975 publication. So Buttery's inability to find these coins certainly weren't uh, for his lack of trying. Unfortunately, however, I've not been able to determine the location of the additional circa 230 missing coins, and Buttrey was equally perplexed by the missing coins, which already seemed to have gone missing by his time. And like him, I assume, given the poor condition of most of the other coins of the 1944 donation, that they were deemed not worth keeping and were disposed of at some point by an early, earlier generation of curators. And from a footnote in Stanley Robinson's British Museum Cyrene catalog, we also learn of Newell's own acquisition of at least 18 coins from Norton's family. Buttrey was able to locate 14 of these coins, and I have found one more. So, all told, um, 469 coins associated with Norton and his activities in Cyrenaica have now been located in the Society's collection. But, as we'll see momentarily, it is unlikely that any of these coins actually came to light during the excavations of 1910-1911. All of these coins associated with Norton at the Society, I suspect, were rather purchased by Norton and others from various locals in various localities of Cyrenaica in the first decade of the 20th century. Peter, I just want to, <clears throat> I'm sorry to interrupt, I just want to make sure that we're not supposed to be seeing your presentation. Oh, you should be seeing my presentation. Yeah, we. I, well, I figured once we got to the coins, we'd be able to see them. Oh, uh, so you, you can't see this? No. All right, let me figure out what's going on then. So uh, this is a photo of the accession records of 1941 and 1944 with the notes of um, the provenance of the coin, as I noted. A uh, photo of uh, Norton and uh, one of the ambulances that he sponsored in France in the First World War. photo of uh, Herbert de Coup and um, the details of his death in a newspaper, as well as a Italian um, magazine cover from, I think, October 1911. Um, Bates's sketch of Cyrene uh, from the survey, as well as this photo of Bates and Norton on uh, Alison Amour's uh, yacht. Uh, and then some photos from the excavation. Um, all of these photos, in fact, were published by Jamie Ullenbrock in uh, her Libyan Studies um, archival um, report. So uh, I'd be happy to provide references to that for anybody interested. And then just uh, some photos of those reports and that pretty much catches us up all right so um in fact in the 1911 report of the excavation charles densmore curtis the team's appointed numismatist indicates as much quote not many coins were found they were all the bronze and many badly corroded and will require careful cleaning during the winter, quite a large number of better preserved coins of bronze and silver were purchased from Arabs. The provenance is, of course, unknown, but must in majority of cases be local, unquote. Elsewhere in the brief report, Curtis provides some clues as to where the coins were found in the course of the excavations and what types they were, but nowhere provides a definitive catalog or illustrations. And frustratingly, he gives no exact number of the coins found in 1910-1911 or their ultimate disposition. In his originally unpublished report of their 1909 survey, now discovered and published by Jamie Ullenbrock, Oric Bates notes that during the few days that they were delayed in Marasuza, which is ancient Apollonia, the port city for Cyrene, Norton purchased a number of smaller antiquities from locals, including coins. When they parted company a few weeks later, Bates brought the coins back to Boston for Norton, who would stay on in Europe for a while, and Bates deposited them at the MFA. Bates also notes a meeting that they had with John Francis Jones, who you'll recall was noted in the 1944 accession record, um, Jones was the British consul in Benghazi um, 
um, in which, um, uh, oh yeah, so Bates also notes a meeting that they had with Jones, the British Consul in Benghazi, in which Jones showed them a number of antiquities, including coins that Jones had collected there. Jones was born in 1857 and had a foreign service career that spanned roughly 40 years from 1881 to 1922, during which time he was stationed in Jeddah, Jerusalem, Beirut, Rhodes, Sarajevo, and Benghazi, where he was in station from 1902 to 1913, where apparently he was wounded, perhaps during the Turkish-Italian conflict. On his return to Benghazi in 1910, Norton remarks that he met again with Jones before heading to Cyrene. If the note associated with the 1944 donation is correct, that the coins had been brought from Cyrene by Jones, it would seem that at some point Norton acquired some or all of the 450 coins from him in the 1944 donation. Soon after his own return to the States, later in 1911, Norton offered to sell a lot, of these, a lot of these coins that he had acquired to the MFA, which raises a number of questions. If, as it seems, Norton considered the coins his own, rather than already belonging to the museum on account of its sponsorship of the excavations, he would have purchased the coins with his own, not with excavation funds. This lot would not then include the few coins excavated during the campaign, since presumably these would have already been in the museum's possession as part of its portage agreement with the Turks, or perhaps they would have been left in the excavation house um, at Cyrene at the end of the 1910 excavation season for further cleaning and study, who knows. In any case, however, the museum, the MFA, was not interested in purchasing Norton's lot. And five years later, in 1916, when he was in France during the war, Norton donated the coins to the MFA instead. So we can presume that the coins donated by Norton to the MFA was the same lot of 180 coins that the MFA, in its turn, donated to the American Numismatic Society in 1941. And it would seem that even as a donation, the MFA had little interest in the lot, which was likely assembled by Norton through various purchases from locals during both the survey in 1909 and the excavation in 1910-1911. The second lot, the one donated by Norton's wife and daughter, may have been assembled in part or in its entirety by John Francis Jones through similar types of purchases during his tenure as British Consul in Benghazi, uh, presumably during his um, time and station there between 1902 and 1913. But how Norton came to acquire these coins is unknown, but most likely as a gift or purchase from Jones, perhaps during their last recorded meeting together in North Africa in 1910, or perhaps by correspondence later on, but certainly before Norton died in 1918. And it was some years after his death in the 1920s that Newell acquired select pieces of this second lot um, from Norton's wife and daughter before the remainder was donated to the society in 1944. So I hope you all were able to follow that. It is a little bit convoluted, but um, nevertheless, um, my conclusion here though is that it does not seem likely that um, any of the coins associated with Norton in the Society's collection were in fact found during the American excavations at Cyrene in 1910-1911, but rather had been purchased in Cyrenaica between 1902 roughly and 1913 from locals who had found the coins in the general region, either as singleton or as hordes. And overall, the composition of the Norton coins, as we'll, show, as we'll see now, supports the notion that the coins were in fact found locally and thus may, may yet be of scientific value despite their lost provenances. Um, so, as we now turn to this brief overview of the coins, I just wanna note that the overwhelming majority of the coins that uh, I've been able to identify and attribute, uh, about 389 of them or 86%, 
were produced in Cyrenaica, and of these, the overwhelming majority of them are bronze coins of the Hellenistic period, produced mostly in Cyrene. All right, so Edward Newell seems to have acquired from Norton's family in the 1920s most of the gold and silver coins, which total 26, and which date from the late 6th century to the 4th century BC. Notable, notable among the silver coins are the fractional issues, which were of particular interest to Newell because of their rarity at the time that he acquired them in the 1920s. So, as I mentioned earlier, the bronze coinage of Cyrene, uh, which is well represented across all periods from the end of the fourth century to the first century BC, um, has recently been studied by Michele Asolate um, in this recent study of um, uh, Cyrenaic and bronze coinage. And I've been using uh, his publication as a guide uh, to um, me. help me uh, reattribute and date uh, this coinage, uh, the majority of this coinage. And in fact, what you'll see here in this first chart are the number of coins represented in the collection of these bronze coinages per period. Um, and this first chart covers the earliest bronze coin issues towards the end of the fourth century down to the time of the coinon in the mid third century. And notable here are the proportion of coins from the autonomous period, as well as from the time of Magus's revolt test, in test. the third century. And this second chart, which just is essentially a continuation of the first chart chronologically, um, illustrates that the greatest proportion of the Norton coins are bronzes of the third to the end of the second century BC, especially those dating towards the end of this period produced by Ptolemy VIII, Ptolemy IX, and Ptolemy Apion. And given the comparatively large number of coins from this period in the collection, their often shared patina and generally very rough condition, it is possible that most of these coins were found hoarded together, but beyond this speculation, um, really I can't say anything more. Um, the other mints of Cyrenaica are less well represented. Um, there is only one silver and one bronze coins, coin of Barque among the Norton uh, coins, um, and eight bronze coins of Euhesperides, all dating between the autonomous period and Magus's revolt. Um, Newell had also, it seems, acquired at least one bronze coin from the Norton family in the, in the 1920s, which when clean proved to be an exceedingly rare issue of Thibron, which Newell published in a, a brief report in 1938. And this is the only coin in the collection um, from Apollonia, again, the port city of Cyrene. Uh, the Roman provincial coinage uh, is represented by only a handful of issues, that of Crassus of 3734 BC, uh, of A. Pupius Rufus of 34 to 31 BC, and one under Augustus and another under Tiberius. Um, at least one and possibly two coins, um, again, condition is hard to uh, determine um, are issues produced in Rome under Trajan for uh, Cyrenaica. Now, turning to those coins produced elsewhere, there are several dozen, mostly later Roman imperial and Byzantine issues. Of the earlier periods, um, uh, there's one silver, or silver coin of Rhodes and bronzes of Corsaira, Arcania. Um, Arcarnania, Athens, and Egypt, as of course we would expect, given the proximity, and a, a single coin of Eubusus in Iberia, which in fact is one of the better preserved coins in the entire collection, as you can see here. Um, there are over a dozen Roman imperial coins, mostly of the third and fourth centuries, mostly struck at Rome, but also including the mints of Mediolanum, Cizicus, Aquileia, um, Heraclea and Constantinople. Many of these coins, um, as you can see in this slide as well as in some of the others, are fragmented. Um, interestingly, this does seem to have been a practice in Cyrenaica of, um, in the later periods where a lot of these uh, bronze coins, including those that have been found in subsequent excavations, have come out of the ground 
cut in half or similarly fragmented. So again, this certainly does indicate that these are local finds and um, are uh, again, illustrative of that uh, local practice of making yet smaller change from small change. Um, as I noted, there are coins, uh, Byzantine coins, about 16 of them, mostly of uh, Heraclius, and most of them struck in Constantinople. And finally, the latest coin in the collection is a coin of the Venetian Republic from the 17th century. Um, really rather remarkable, in fact. So um, overall, Types of coins struck outside of Cyrenaica found among the Norton coins generally align with the coins recorded by Buttrey from the American excavations at Cyrene, which also included Greek period coins of Rhodes, Corsaira, and Egypt, Roman imperial coins of the third and fourth century, Byzantine coins of Heraclius, and early modern Italian coins. Generally rough appearance and similar patina to the other coins in the Norton group would suggest that these Norton coins were again likely found in Cyrenaica. And if we use the coins recorded by Buttrey in the final report of the excavations of the extramural sanctuary of Demeter and Persephone at Cyrene, which is the title of this 1998 publication, as a point of comparison, it would seem again that the Norton coins in the ANS collection generally align with these finds. Buttrey recorded 808 coins total from the excavations, of which 94% were produced in Cyrenaica, 6% um, were not, and 2% are those from Italy. So, as you can see in this comparison, this does um, generally align then um, with the Norton coins, which would again suggest that this is um, a, a comparative sample, um, sort of randomly collected, which uh, perhaps randomly collection, collected, which does generally align with the types of finds that have come out of the ground um, from excavations in, Cyre uh, in Cyrenaica uh, throughout the 20th century. So um, I'd like to conclude by noting that while I've not yet been able to find anything written by Norton himself about the hundreds of coins he gathered from Cyrenaica and elsewhere, he seems generally to have been quite keen to, to acquire as many coins as he could without discrimination. While there are certainly um, early gold and silver coins among the group, most of them, as we have seen, are low value later Hellenistic issues precisely the type of coin that a discriminating collector like Newell or a fine arts museum might have had less interested in. It is no surprise then that the MFA took a pass on these coins and that Newell cherry picked some of the finest coins from the Norton family for himself. That most of the coins that Norton gathered in the early 20th century in Cyrenaica are now safeguarded at the ANS, even without a secure excavation provenance, may prove to be of scientific value yet as we continue to photograph, recatalog, and publish all of these coins on our online catalog mantis. So with that, I would like to thank you very much and certainly am welcome to uh, take any questions that you may have about this rather interesting group of coins and whatever I may or may not know about Richard Norton and his activities. Seems that we have one in the chat. Norton died in 1918 at the age of 46. Any details on his death? Yeah, he had uh, returned to Paris, um, I, I think on business, and somehow had con contracted meningitis and died a day after um, he got sick. So it was just a very rapid and very unfortunate death. Um, you know, something totally unexpected and um, you know, really rather tragic in, in many ways obviously for his family, but uh, also for the world of scholarship. Certainly somebody with a tremendous amount of potential. Oh, there, there's a question there. Anyone caught for the murder? Um, no. Uh, this, this actually turned into quite a, um, a political, politically charged issue. Um, between um, the US, Italy, uh, and also the British. So um, before 
There, there, there was a moment, in fact, through the summer of 1911, um, where Norton was making plans to return to, uh, to Cyrene uh, for the excavations. Uh, but um, on, a, on account of Deku's murder and um, what uh, Norton and others were convinced was Italian, uh, uh, the Italians having a hand in this, um, Norton, through his, his State Department connections, he was a very well-connected man, um, was, was able to convince uh, the State Department, who then convinced the U.S. Navy, to um, provide an escort, uh, the USS Chester, which was um, one of the uh, early 1890 gunboats, um, to escort the, or, or to actually be the vessel on which the excavation party would return to Cyrene um, later in 1911 um, as an added measure of protection. But um, in the meantime, of course, um, Norton found it very hard to suppress his feelings about Deku's murder and um, what obviously was about to unfold in uh, um, North Africa uh, with Italian military force. And so he wrote what he wrote in these Italian paper or in these British papers, which then um, came to the attention of the Italian officials. And this then started to have all sorts of, created all sorts of complications uh, which ultimately meant that uh, Norton was not invited to come to Italy, which by that point in the fall of 1911 was under, uh, or to uh, Cyrene, which at that point in fall of 1911 was under Italian control. So at that point, this whole expedition, um, the plans for it and, and the rest just fell apart. And um, subsequently, the Italians uh, began to uh, excavate at uh, Cyrene where in fact, they continue to excavate to this day. Um, let's see. Um, uh, compared to other finds in the region, were these Norton finds any more illegible damage than any others? Seems like a high rate of illegibility. Um, you know, in fact, when I was uh, I, I was discussing all of this, or a similar uh, question actually with Michele Asolati uh, not too long ago, and uh, he has been working on excavation coins from Cyrene for a very long period. Um, uh, Buttry also complains, uh, and Michele basically says that a lot of these coins, uh, because they're bronze, uh, they, they do come out of the ground in very, very poor condition. Uh, Buttry also made similar complaints, and so I would say that what we have um, is not terribly different from a lot of the other uh, coins that have come out of the ground from that area over, over the decades. Um, I, I do think that some of our coins could potentially be cleaned um, that might help aid with some of the attribution, but um, in fact, most of them um, are clear enough, um, and I, I say that with a grain of salt, that you know, I, I have been able to um, attribute most of those that are reasonably legible, often with Michele's help, in fact. Um, all right, so would love to know more about the sequencing of imagery on the coins and why, if Cyrene was under the control of the Ptolemies for a long period, uh, is there very little similarity uh, in the coin imagery? Um, that's a very good question for which I don't really have a particularly good answer. Um, I don't really pretend to be a specialist in Hellenistic, especially later Hellenistic coinage. Um, I've been doing my best certainly to get up to speed uh, with the coinage of Cyrene um, and uh, certainly with our Ptolemaic online coin project, Ptolemaic Coins Online, PCO. Please do visit if you haven't already, uh, which is based on Kathy Lorber's uh, recent publication, uh, which I've read, um, of course. I uh, still wouldn't claim to know enough about it to um, be able to answer that question, I, I think, intelligently. So I will try to slide slip it if I can. Um, uh, Joel Allen saying, I see that Oric Bates also died in 1918 uh, in Kentucky at age 34 of pneumonia. Yeah, and in fact, he, he died a rather unhappy and bitter man because um, even before that 1909 survey, he had, on his own account, gone to North Africa um, to uh, uh, 
trek around the area and see what possibilities there may be for future archaeological work. Um, and it was uh, Bates who approached um, Fairbanks and um, others uh, to get sponsorship for a subsequent project in uh, Cyrenaica, particularly. And um, through you know various machinations, um, it seems actually, in fact, through Norton himself. And um, Norton doesn't really come off as as a particularly shining figure in his relationship with Bates and and the sort of behind the scenes activities and correspondence that he had. Um, he, he seems to have ultimately sort of stage managed to get Bates shoved out of um, all of this activity uh, with the AIA MFA in Cyrenaica and took it over for himself. And Bates subsequently um, have went off and tried to do what he could elsewhere, um, but was very, very unhappy about the whole situation and really quite bitter about it ultimately. Um, just trying to. Uh, there was one that got skipped. Did the 1910 expedition only excavate at the necropolis? Yes, they. Um, they they started in that area. They they were mostly working on I, I think it was about half a dozen or so tombs um, during that period. Um, of one of Jamie Olenbrock's papers in Libyan Studies, one that she co-authored, uh, in fact, the more recent one, was an attempt to um, re-catalog and locate some of the material that came out of those uh, necropolis and also then uh, correlate it with uh, subsequent excavations as well. So, um, you know, the, the original excavation report that appeared in the 1911 AIA bulletin is, is really rather poor, um, not terribly informative. And so uh, Olenbrock and uh, her colleague have done great service by um, trying to rectify that with um, their attempts of looking at the material as well as using uh, the archives and so forth. Uh, all right, so Jonathan Kagan notes that those wishing to know more about the Norton family, their connection to Victor uh, David Brenner and James Loeb and their role in Brenner's commission for the penny should look at the soon to be published ANS Symposium. Yes, Jonathan uh, actually wrote a really great paper for that. Um, in fact, it might be up on our YouTube channel, um, those of you who want to take a look at it uh, beforehand. Um, we're hoping to get that uh, symposium publication out later this um, year and in fact um rather embarrassingly i still owe jesse craft the editor of that a, a final version of my paper for that um yes and joel um has provided a link to bates's papers at the university of delaware um and jamie gray notes here that uh, she loves the 1910 photo of the sweet little a and s building in the style of an ancient temple yes that is still standing in fact uh, when i started my tenure at the a and s in 2002 we were still located um, in that building there there was an addition to it um, that was built in the 1930s because already by that point the a and s was running out of library space and collection space um, and it, it was variously modified and uh, remodeled at, at points in the 1950s and later on. In fact, um, there, there is a centennial volume of the ANS's history that was published in 1958. And I'm um, forgetting at the moment, uh, unfortunately, who the author was, but uh, there's some really wonderful photos of these sort of Star Trek remodels that are remodeling that was done. Of, of some of the galleries and so forth in the 1950s. But we uh, left that building in 2004 to move downtown. But it still stands, um, and it was purchased by our neighbors up on the terrace, uh, the, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and they now use it as a, as a place uh, for storage as well as exhibitions. In fact, they also built a really cool glass tunnel going between their building and uh, our old building. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.